again, everybody. Welcome to the Johnny Rhodes Middle Aged and Lazy podcast. Uh, this is another candid, off the cuff interview with my very good friend that joins me today, uh, travel buddy, opponent, and tag team partner for many years, Mad Dog Max. Mad Dog, how you doing, mate? How you doing, mate? I'm good. Yeah, yeah, good for you. Yeah, cracking. Uh, we're limited to 45 minutes as always, so I'm not going to waste any time because we've got to try and cram as much in as we can. Uh, okay. So I want to ask you, what is your earliest memory of wrestling? Uh, what, as a fan? Yeah. Oh. Um, it's, it's one of two. It's really hard because, I've, you know, when your memories mix up and you don't know whether you were four for that one or five for that one or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I know I got talked to a show at Walsall Town Hall very, very early on. Um, and that was like, looking back now, that would have been one of Klondike Jake's shows. Right. But I don't quite know how young I was or whatnot. Um, and around the same period, um, I remember watching Owen versus Brett on the TV, and that was just magical for me. But I don't know which one came first, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Was there, was there that, was that a point that you sort of got hooked on wrestling, or was that later on? Uh, I got hooked on it for a good couple of years. Um, Brett was basically my hero. Do you know what I mean? Whatever Brett did, um, I followed. He was like my child of hero. Um, and then it's odd, really. I got to, a, I, I, I don't know, maybe early teens, um, and my dad's sitting there watching the wrestling with me, and he's like, you know, he's not really punching him, don't you? Um, and I looked, and he wasn't because I couldn't see, you know, blood coming out of his head or whatever. And the best way I can describe it is, I felt like a girlfriend that had been cheated on, and I felt like, <laughs> I felt like Bret Hart had lied to me my whole childhood. So I stopped watching wrestling for a number of years. And then the irony to it is, it's my dad that got me back into wrestling because I'm, it's late night, I'm, I'm like asleep in my bed and he's like, Matt, Matt, come downstairs quick. There's this guy called Goldberg on telly and he's killing everyone. Um, and I sat with him and watched WCW, but what got me was the cruiserweights and this, that and the other. Um, and then I started watching Mick Foley and, and, and it kind of uh, snowballed into me desperately wanting to be a wrestler, you know. Did he think that the, you know, Goldberg beating people up would be, you know, something you'd like because it was more real than something that you could blatantly see wasn't? I think it was more he liked it. I, I still liked wrestling. I just felt really cheated by Brett and fell out with him. Right. <laughs> uh, only because of what my dad said, you know. Uh, no, I think it was more that Goldberg, uh, Austin, that kind of wrestler, that kind of era was more palatable to his tastes. So he felt like, come and watch this with me. I want to share this with you. But then I would go off and watch Las LaRue or La Parker or... Charvo, the cruiserweight, a little like me, you know. So, yeah, I think it was more palatable to him, not me. I, I, I just love wrestling. I just had a, a couple of year blip with it because of him. <laughs> you said you like the cruiserweights. Were they, were they your heroes at that time? You know, because it was something that you watched or? Well, the, again, this is weird because there's so many memories mixed up, don't they? And obviously, yeah. I've, you know, I've, I've drunken a lot and I've taken a lot of substances over the years. So my memory, I kind of like... I have to pick things out and hope that they're, they're a real memory, you know. Um, but I remember speaking to the careers advisor at school, um, and she basically said that I was too small to be a professional wrestler. She said, like, you know, be a teacher or a policeman or something, you know, you're never going to be a, a wrestler. So I went off and I printed all, like, the, the both profiles of, like, Lash LaRue and Charvo, and I was like, well, only five, five, six like me, if they can, I can do it, you know. So then I kind of attached my flag to that cruiserweight division, so they did become my heroes in a, in a, in a strange way, you know. Yeah, sort of through default, really, because they, they matched you kind of thing. Yeah, and I was told that I wouldn't do it, and then I could see 20 guys doing it for the first hour on Nitro every week, and they were, they were better, to me personally at that point, they were better wrestlers as well. They could do anything, you know. It might not be the style that I use now, um, but they're the guys that got me in. Um, a small tip bit, I, I got years later, I got to be on a show with Rey Mysterio. Um, and obviously he's this big superstar and he had his own room and all this nonsense. And I knocked the door and he let me in. He was a wonderful guy. And I had sort of five, ten minutes with him. And I actually told him this story that I'm telling you now. And I'm like, thanks to you and your mates. And I was like, you know, Lash LaRue. And he burst out laughing at that because I, I don't mean to demean Lash LaRue in any way, shape or form, but nobody's heard of him for like maybe 10, 15 years. So he yeah. knew I was the real deal because I was listing all these obscure cruiserweights. I was like, yeah, Al Dandy. You know what I mean? I was, yeah. And I was... He's, he's, not, he's, not someone that's, he's not someone that's often on the list of, uh, you know, cruiserweight flyers, is he, really? No, I don't mean to demean him. I'd work him in a heartbeat. I loved him, especially because he, not only was he small, but he 
had the same hair as me. There was even even more similarity, so I just thought he was awesome. But yeah, um, telling Rey Mysterio to his face that story was pretty cool. I got I got a handshake and a hug for that one. That was cool. Was there a point that you realised it was something that you actually needed to do? Like, you know, you said that you told your career advisor that it's what you wanted to do, but at what point did it become something that you, you know, you needed to do? Like, because you know, at school there was other options, weren't there? But was it was it not until you actually found the the school or whatever that you, you decided this is this is definitely it now? This is definitely a thing. No. Are you over and break it up? Can you hear me? Yeah, fine. Uh, yeah, it was one definable, clean moment that made me be a wrestler. It was one one moment. Um, do you remember the Royal Rumble 2000? Cactus, Tra- Cactus Chat versus Triple H? Yeah. I was a huge Mick Foley fan, especially because he was the underdog. Do you know what I mean? He was the guy that lost a lot, but he tried really hard. Do you know what I mean? I was a huge, huge Mick Foley fan. Um, and in that match, he takes the, the pedigree. Boom. And Jim Ross is like doing an amazing job in commentary. He's kind of going, by God, nobody kicks out of the pedigree. Nobody kicks out of the pedigree. Everybody had kicked out the pedigree. Ultimate Warrior, no, sold it and run around the ring, you know. But for that five seconds, I completely believed what Jim Ross was saying. Um, and Mick Foley kicks out. And I'm, I think I'm 15 at the time. And I rolled backwards and I hit my head on the floor so hard that it like made me see stars, you know. By the time I'd sat back up, he took another pedigree and he'd lost. Um, and I've never known emotion go up and down in that kind of level before. And I literally looked to my brother, who was sitting watching it with me, and I said, I am going to be a professional wrestler. Um, that was, he's rumble in January. Yeah. Well, that, that would have been January 2000. And by August, I had a training, I don't know if there was a score or anything. Um, but it was one definable moment, and then you know, within eight months, I was arrested basically. But it was all that one moment, it was like a big rocky took my arse, you know. Yeah, so what was your training process? How did that all start? Okay, um, so I went back to the careers advisor again because I thought I thought that like you had to run everything through a careers advisor. I didn't, you know, what I mean, that's just how the school set it up for me, you know. So I went back to the careers advisor again. I said, I'm not taking no for an answer, blah blah blah. And, in the school library at the time, I printed off um, a school in Kent. It was like an NWA Hammerlock in Kent. Yeah. I think it was Kent anyway. And I said, look, you know, there are wrestling schools. I, I want to do this. Um, and she looked at it with me. And then she went on the website with me and found um, Steve Logan's name on the website. And it actually said he was from Birmingham. And at the time, I don't know whether it was just through the shows that he purchased via them or just for the website, but it listed him as the NWA Hammerlock Commissioner. So I was like... Yeah, he, he bought from shows from Andre. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. And um, I just knew that he was a wrestler from TV and I knew I could find him. I'd already previously, before that, stalked Pat Roach a little bit at his scrapyard, um, trying to be a wrestler, but he, did, he was very, very nice, but he didn't want to teach us, do you know what I mean? He was really nice. Um, but then I started stalking... Steve Logan, you know, find, found out where his toy boxing gym was and wrote to him. I wrote him a letter, actually, with a CV. You know, you would fresh out of school. Yeah, yeah, I wrote him a letter. Um, and to go and meet him, I put a full three-piece suit on, you know, tie, waistcoat, everything. Um, and he was just wonderful. And, and, and that, that's it then, you know. Uh, was there anybody there when you trained early on that stayed around and still wrestling? Uh, Carl. Carlos, um, we know him as Carl Brooks, obviously, he wrestled this Carl Misery, and, and now he's superstar Carlos. He was there, um, and the second you saw him do anything, lock up, walk, breathe, you just knew he was a natural professional wrestler, you know, he was just brilliant. So I, I wasn't a natural professional wrestler at all, so this sounds kind of slow, but I don't mean it that way. I just knew if I was going to be any good, I'd just have to attach myself to him, if that makes sense. So, if anyone yeah. was like, oh, we need a volunteer and Carl got off, I'd get up. If Carl did something, I'd copy him, because I wasn't natural and I could see that he was, you know. Yeah, he's, he's still going there, man. He's, he's amazing. Yeah, he looks great too, doesn't he? Yeah. Best he's ever okay. looked, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you trained, I suppose Carl was kind of the trainer, was he? Um, well, I, I, Steve was still teaching at that point, so I still kind of got the last days of Steve. 
um, you know, showing us bits and, and taking us through our paces. And not only that, John, I wanted it really, really bad. Like training was every Saturday and every Sunday. Um, but I got hold of Steve's um, Thai boxing schedule and every, like, say, Tuesday at seven or whatever it was, I noticed that he didn't have a class. So I'd just show up and say, Steve, can you show me this or can you show me that? I was probably a huge, huge pest to him. I'd probably done his editing. But eventually he took pity on me and he'd show me this and he'd show me that and he'd show me the other, you know. Which shows perseverance and hard work pays off, though, at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I probably absolutely done his editing in them early days, but he helped me so much because of it, you know. I was just pest. <laughs> so you trained at K-Star after being a Mick Foley fan. What came next? What was your first? Oh, uh, what, like, after initial wrestling matches or my first match, sorry? Your, your first match. Oh, God, that was a... It was a how, long, how long? How long was that after training started? Okay, well, this is what uh, this is the story. Really, I, it was very, very soon after um, because I would just turn up to the shows and I would help put the ring up because I just wanted to breathe wrestling. I wanted to be around it. Just touching the ring boards was like exciting, you know. So I'd turn up to every show and put the ring up and that, or, or or at least pretend I was putting the ring up. Do you know what I mean? I just wanted to be there. Do that um, and Steve said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve turned to me and he says, like, have you got your gear? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've got my gear. And he's like, okay, well, so-and-so is not going to be here for tonight's show. Um, you, you're on. Um, and I didn't have my gear. I was a complete liar and a blagger, just, you know, just desperate to be there. So, and it was before I drove. I was only 15. So I got on two buses and sprinted 30 minutes, got my gear and went all the way back, you know, and, and wrestled complete accident but I was just so desperate to be a part of it you know Do you, who was that with and and you know where and how was the match it was at Sutton Town Hall um massive sellout um they put me in a thermos um and it was against a guy called Duncan do you remember him K-Star lad Duncan is he a little short lad well, he was. He's he's huge you now. He's about six yeah, well, foot yeah. four, but yeah, he's mad. He's actually grown up into a, a lovely young man. But that time, I think we were both young and idiotic, and we clashed a little bit. And he got me thermos, and he turned it on sideways and punched me right in the head. But I probably deserved it, so I'm not moaning about that, you know. <laughs> so, so uh, would you be comfortable now showing somebody that match? No, no, no chance. No, no chance. I'm, I'm, it's it's, it's on a VHS somewhere in my dad's house, and I hope it, you know, finds its way in the bin somehow. You developed Mad Dog Max as a character, you know, to a degree. It's had several sort of incarnations, isn't it? You know, you've always had the same name, but it sort of developed, you know, as a human. What was your inspiration behind the first Mad Dog Max that arrived? Oh my God! This is you. You know off the answers to these. That's why I'm asking it. That's why I'm asking it because I want you to tell me. (laughs) Uh, Basically, um, the name came from. Do you remember the the PlayStation One game WWF Attitude? Yeah. You used to be able to make your own character and then give him a name, but you could give him a name that wasn't on the roster at the time. But like you know, Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler were doing the really crap commentary on the game. Uh, They would reference the name whatever you pick so i just thought mad dog sounded awesome you know so i picked mad dog and bizarrely enough i don't know why if you were to look at the the character that i designed now he just looked like jerry sags from the nasty boys i don't know why i wanted to become jerry sags that wasn't conscious but exactly the same hair and very much looked like jerry sags with mad dog as the name and then when steve was like well what did you want to be called i just blurted out mad dog it just just came out of my mouth if you know what i mean it wasn't conscious and it's just stuck 20 years later, I'm still using it. You had that lovely blue mask on, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Going back to the Mick Foley thing, um, Mick Foley was like my biggest inspiration as a 15-year-old kid, you know. Um, this sounds like I'm, I'm fishing for pity and I'm not in any way, but like I was kind of like that, that I was I wasn't never like the nerdy kid who was being bullied, but I was never the popular kid. I was very insecure. Um, my parents had split up not long before, and all this kind of nonsense. And Mick Foley, kind of like like I said earlier, he was the underdog, and he was always tacked on. And that I I absolutely attached every bit of my personality to him at that point in my life. I don't know why. 
I was probably just looking for something, going for a bad time. But like for some reason, you know, most people will like attach themselves to a band, like, oh, Nirvana's helped me through this yeah. difficult time. Or um, this movie's helped me through this difficult time. For some reason, I can't tell you why, being like 15, 16, 17, 18, Mick Foley was just like this mad um, inspiration, which wasn't good for my health because I kind of copied a lot of his stuff early days and I don't know why. I, um, yeah, it was, yeah, I had a horrendous mask because I thought I was Mick Foley, really. <laughs> so, um, you started going, you know, within quite a short time, to be fair, you started doing bits for other kind of Midlands-based promotions, didn't you? You know, there was, yeah, you know, yeah. Dave, Dave Reese popped up and there was, uh, I can't remember what they were called, something flags, four flags. Yeah, that's it. There was loads. Um, the Roll. first one, John, yeah, that's it. The first outside booking I ever got was for Brian. It was for where, sorry? The first, sorry, mate, the connection isn't very good. I'm going to move a little bit closer to to the modem, give me a second. I hope that that helps us. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, beautiful. Okay. So the first one was the first outside, outside, first outside was where? It was for Brian Dixon. It was for Star. Um, Steve got us that job. He phoned. He basically phoned Brian up and said, "I've got two or three lads that are decent. Um, do you want to take a look at them?" Um, and the next thing I knew, I was in a car with Cowboy Carter going to Skegness or somewhere, and then. The month yeah. after that, we were on um, we were on Hamley in Stoke for him. And then the month after that, we did Telford. The first couple of outside bookings I got was for Dixon. Um, and then, um, via Keith, uh, we got work with Dave Reese as well. Um, that was really cool because they were old school promoters. They were real promoters, you know. So that was a really good experience. And to my detriment, and this is all my fault. I know how I reacted to it badly. The first people I worked for were Steve Logan. Uh, Brian Dixon and Dave Reese, all world of sport guys, all my, you know doing things right. And then I got a couple of jobs for people that might not be as professional. And my problem being a 15, 16 year old doing that, or 17 year old, whatever I would have been at that point, I didn't treat them with the respect I should have because I just saw the huge gulf in professionalism. And I took the mick too much. And I do look back at that quite quite angrily, if that makes sense. That yeah, makes no, sense. No, I, 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 I totally hear you. That I'm. I'm, I'm you know, guilty of that, the same kind of thing. But yeah. for Brian, so early on, that was pretty big, right? Um, it was really scary, John. It was scary stuff. Because um, to me, when you, when, when you come from, like, you know, regional Birmingham boy, you know, Warsaw boy, to a national promotion, yeah, you ain't going to get no bigger than that, and you've only been in the, the, the job for minutes. so. You know, that's you. One of the first shows I did for Dixon, John, was at Hanley, um, and he had this big, huge battle royal on, or Royal Rumble, whatever it was. And some of these names now, now some of these names are so respected, but I remember sitting in the room, um, and I knew who they were, because you know this, I love my wrestling history, and I just, you know, it completely enveloped my life. And Tony St. Clair was sitting in the corner reading a newspaper in a wrestling singer. Um, and I know who Tony St. Clair is, so I'm there and I've got the cold sweats and I'm like, there's Tony St. Clair over there, that's Tony St. Clair, you know. Um, and like the lad that was with me was like, oh, who's that bloke over there? Who's that old fella there? And I actually said, that old fella over there could eat you for breakfast and chew you out and then eat you up again for dessert, you know. You know, I, I was looking around the room and there was Robbie Brookside, Kendo was on the bill. Obviously, I didn't see him because he had his own room, and that's, that's what it is. Um, Condite Kate was on the bill. James Mason was on the bill. Johnny Kidd was on the bill. Um, Cannonball Grizzly was on the bill. Every like All these major stars were there for this Battle Royal thing that I was also there for, and it blew my tiny little mind. You know, like um, Tony St. Clair in the Battle Royal give me one of them Mongolian double chop things, you know, and I... I sold it like someone had chopped my head off. I think I rolled four times backwards, you know. Um, it was it was an experience. And like you say, you're not going to get any bigger in this country, especially with the wrestlers that they had at their disposal then, you know. Was there like a specific person that you'd wrestle on a regular, someone that you trained with or, you know, because when you were doing these little jobs, like like the, the four flags or whatever it was or, or Dave Reese's, 
or, yeah. or brawl or whatever, wherever it was. Was there was there like a specific match that you had? Well, whenever we wrestled opponent? for Dave Reese, yeah, whenever we wrestled for Dave Reese, you wrestled whoever the fuck he told you because he was the boss. You know what I mean? Yeah. He run his company properly. So yeah, there was no like, more boss than Dave Reese to be fair. No, was there? no, no. Every other word was a swear word. Um, he, do you know what though? I learned so much off him. I, I've heard stories since, and I don't know about him. He, he never did anything wrong to me. Mm. He looked after me. And I, I, honestly, I learned an awful lot from him in those early days. But yeah, when we worked for Dave, we worked, we worked against whoever we were told to because he was a real wrestling promoter and a real boss, you know. Um, but on some of the smaller places, people would ask, oh, what do you want to do? And that's nice. I think that's lovely. And I would always say, Carl, because he was the best at that point. He was the best I had access to, if that makes sense. And I knew by wrestling him more. I would get better. Um, Steve Logan taught me something, and I know we've discussed this before, so if I'm boring you, I'm sorry, but he always used to say, and he said this, if I said this in my school, I'd probably get sued, but he said, uh, you know, wrestling, he said it's like sex. The more people you do it with, the better you get. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And, and, he, and he made that joke, and, and he was right, but at that point in time, Carl was the best wrestler, so whenever I was asked, I was like, I want, I want to wrestle him over there, you know, and, and that's, I suppose me and Carl wrestled each other a lot because of that in those very, very early days, you know. From that point, did you develop the, you know, Mad Dog Max without the mask a little more and turn the boy into the man kind of thing? Uh, No, no, I just turned into another boy. (laughs) (laughs) Was it another boy that I'd like somebody else that wasn't Mick Foley? No, not really. Yes and no. And you, you've got a lot to, to answer for this in a good way. Um, first of all, I knew that I couldn't turn up to a Brian Dixon show in a thermos that looked a bit like Mick Foley's mask. Do you know what I mean? So I kind of had that self-awareness as if so, right, I've got to grow up now and put some lycra on and try and get a tan and, and look like a wrestler, you know? And then shortly after that period, maybe 2003, you can correct me on these dates because I don't know. Um, but you kind of introduced me to a wave of British wrestling that I hadn't seen before as well. Do you, you, you know what I mean? I knew kind of like the Midlands touring wrestlers because of the, the Jake shows and stuff like that and other people that had been on World of Sport but now worked for Jake, like I'd seen Scrubber and Blondie and people like that. But I hadn't seen, um, say, Johnny Saint wrestle 12 five-minute rounds or, or 10-minute rounds or whatever, you know. And you kind of introduced me to that. And I remember you showing me Pete Roberts and, and that kind of thing. And that kind of tweaked what I wanted to do again. I wanted to wrestle then, you know, I wanted to, you know. <laughs> so Mad Dog Max became the wrestler. Well, I, I almost remember thinking, oh, Mad Dog's a really shit name for the kind of wrestling that I want to do. But I've had it so long now, I can't, I can't get rid of it, you know. Has there ever been another name that you thought, oh, I might give that a try? Uh, only around Mad Dog, like Mad Dog this or Mad Dog that. I've never got rid of Mad Dog yeah. at all. I think I wrestled like a couple of um, bouts in a thermos for Dave Reese because, again, him being the boss and him being a classic old school guy, because I'd wrestled as Mad Dog in the same venue the month before, there was no way he was having me back. He was like, well, you were on last month. And I was like, yeah, but I want to work. I want to work. I need to work. So he gave me like a thermos and just called me whatever, you know. So I did a few jobs like that, but not. I never considered changing, I don't think, anyway. Yeah, I think it was about two... I think, yeah, it, def- it definitely was. 2004 was yeah. our first Holiday Park show. Yeah. Which was sort of East Coasty. For me, that was massive, because I sort of grew up watching Holiday Park wrestling, you know, as a, as a kid on holiday. And yeah. you know the learning curve. As much as it was just one job on sort of like an Easter holiday or Maybank holiday or whatever it was... It was massive, for, you know, huge. Yeah. Just it wasn't that holiday park lifestyle because it was just one show. But to me, it was the greatest thing ever. What's your thoughts and opinions on holiday park wrestling and and that one? You know, I, I remember taking you to that one in two thousand and four when we did Bob's, and to me, it was huge. It was the greatest thing ever, you know, and and a massive learning curve because I learned so much from doing that. Not just Bob's, but like when we did the ones for John Coppin and afterwards. Yes. Greatest time of my life. Um, that first one, I understood how big it was. Um, again, partially because of you. I have to credit you for uh, quite a lot, really. You know, that's why you bought me, really. So I'll put you over in it. Yeah, well, yeah, of course it is. No one else does. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you, you kind of introduced me to 
like a different side of wrestling, like, oh, Matt, read this book or watch this shoot interview and things like that. Like, I, I had never watched a shoot interview until you gave me one, you know. I think it was a Jake the Snake one or something. I, I don't even know, but you'd given it me, you know. And through reading certain books, uh, Dynamite Kid or, or William Regal or whatever, I, don't, I can't even tell you what source material it was, but I'd cottoned on to how important the holiday camps were to learning and how many of the greats had passed through them. So by the time you um, took me to one, I was already appreciative of how big it was. So I did, you know, I, I was I was pretty much seeing the same boat as you, really. I was I was in awe of it, you know. And, and a crowd like I, I'd certainly never seen a crowd like it before, you know. Like even yeah. like, much as I'd done, I had done Brian's at Butlins before. But yes. that didn't quite feel the same. It, it, it was the same, but it wasn't the same. Because Can I interject it, a little bit there, John? It, yeah. You know, when we did, when I personally, when I did those early camp jobs for Dixon, it was like riding a bike with stabilizers on because I had Frankie Sloan telling me exactly what to do. I mean, he could yeah. have a match with a broomstick. When we did that a couple of years later, there was no safety net. We had to just entertain these people that weren't wrestling fans but there might be 800 of them there you know and the early ones i didn't there weren't any less important to me but i could have been brain dead and frankie sloan would have still told me what to do or or, or whatever wrestler i was in the ring would you know i mean i think my first tag on a holiday camp was me and dean all all mark against frankie sloan on the vegetable i could have been a six foot carrot in the match so it would have been amazing you know Whereas when yeah. me and you did Yarmouth for Bob, we had no stabilisers. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I mean, I was going to say, when I did the, the, the ones before Bob's, I felt like I was just there to make the numbers up rather than, you know, we... one of the one of the four that makes the team. Yes. So yes. It was very yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, that very next, I think it was the next year, we started doing every week yeah. through John Coppin. Yeah, we did call back, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Bob called us back, didn't he, after that one? So I remember thinking, it, it, yeah. well, we did a good job, you know, yeah. I think it was like every, every other week, every other Friday or something through that 04 summer. That's right. But the year yeah. after, uh, we'd do like Sunday to Thursday for John Coppin and then Friday for Bob or every other right. Friday for Bob. And then, and then sort of somewhere in Wales on the Saturday and away we go again. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, because I remember this. This is harsh. I remember doing that run for John Coffin, which was amazing. We'd finish in, say, like, Newquay in Wales, like, Wales. Then we'd go all the way from Wales, cross country to Great Yarmouth. Like, literally, we'd see two beaches in a day, cross the country, do Great Yarmouth on a Friday, get the cheapest, cheapest, like, £12.50 bed and breakfast, get drunk so we couldn't even remember what we were doing. Then the next day, wake up and drive back to Cardiff to wrestle for an independent promotion. You know, that yeah. was some good weeks. That was that was a lot of fun. Uh, and the biggest learning curve ever, because you were, you were yeah. doing huge crowds on the parks, on the holiday parks. A totally different style, because it was more... It wasn't comedic, but it was more cowboys and Indians than I'd oh, ever done yeah. before. Yeah. Um, but then again, when you go to Wales, you have to tweak it again to do something yeah. totally different because they're not going to buy that shit that we were doing on the Aldi parks. I you know, just want to so... take something back a little bit as well because I've just said for some independent promotion, those li- those South Wales wrestling promotions were amazing. I did love them and I loved the people there. So I don't want to sound like I'm belittling that, but I just meant that they were a different kind of organisation. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, there were some there were some great ones in Wales. To be fair, Celtic and and South Wales that young boy rang, yeah. and um, yeah. you know, cracking good times and and cracking stories and good talent and you know we were always looked after well. I think. I would say I would say not always good talent, but always enthusiastic talent, and that often can get you by. Does that make sense, John? I'm not belittling yeah. anybody. I mean, like what I mean by that is, like four years before, I've been in a room with like Robbie Brookside and Tony Sinclair, and by proxy, Kendo Nagasaki and Klondike, you know, Klondike Kate and Johnny Kidd, and I went from that, like four years later, to be in a room with these raw, hungry lads from South Wales who. Do you know what I mean? They were raw and hungry and they just, they were very enthusiastic. So I'm not running them down in any way because I look back at that time quite fondly, you know. Yeah, I mean, like good talent to me is not necessarily their 
ability, it's their willingness. And also, the fact that they're not, so, not they've only been going. Sorry, mate. Also, they've only been going for six months. Some of them have nurtured, grown into phenomenal wrestlers, haven't they? They've only been going six months a year. You know, they were naturally green. That's all. You know. Yeah, but but loved because they were local boys. Yeah. You know, which is half the battle, isn't it? You know, if you're over, you're over. Don't give a shit what you do. Do you remember how old the pass he was? He murdered that fucking hell. They yeah. loved him. They absolutely loved him. He couldn't do the moves I could do, but I couldn't dream of being over as him there. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? He was he was phenomenal. He was. Do you remember yeah. that elbow he used to do at the top? He was about 30 stone. Yeah, and, and, and literally didn't give a shit about his, his self to get himself over. You know, he was hey, just man. top man. Yeah. I like him. I like, yeah. And his brother, totally contrast, yet still like I mean like not not a very gifted wrestler by any stretch of the imagination, but so nice and so willing and you know somebody I really enjoyed being on with. Whatever he did, he got he got booed if he was a villain, he got cheered if he was a baby face. You know, I, I won't knock him. I, I liked working with him, you know, I did. I know we both did, so that, you know that's the end result. There, there's some bouting uh Stuff of ours from Wales on the YouTube, and there one tag we did with, with Kate and, uh, and, 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 and the lads in New Zealand. Yeah, I remember Marcus Gordon, Kate Callis. Yeah, yeah, I remember the matches oh. very well, and I remember being pleased with them. But I, I've got this weird thing, John. Um, I can't, I can't watch myself wrestle, I don't know why, I will, I'll force myself to if I know I've got something to learn or I've messed up or something like that, but I really, like, you know, this interview, I won't watch this back, I don't like watching myself, so I've, I've not seen them, you know. I, I really hate watching myself in the ring, but when I know it actually did all right, you know, and, yeah. and I know I have three people around me to help me make it all right, do you know what I mean? So I can quite comfortably watch yeah. that one. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was 05 we first went to America, wasn't it? Really? I, I thought it was 03, so that's, that's funny, isn't it? Yeah, 05 was the first trip there. Wait, you didn't, you didn't do mine, with, you no, know, that one you did with Sal I, I mean, until 04? Uh, so did you go in 03? Is that where I've messed the dates up in my I own went head? In first off, yeah, to, to Kentucky. Yeah. And then, you know, I'd already done the Philadelphia one that I hated. That, but I yeah. went to Kentucky yeah. in 03. And then I took you, and then was it you and Sal on the first time you went, or was it just you on the first one? Just, just me and you on the first. No, me, you, and Sal on the first one. Then me and you on the second one. I think. I think. Yeah. Well, that was yeah. that was um, that was that was an experience as well because we were we were somewhere totally different. Yet, yeah. Went on and did it like when we went on in in Kentucky. Yes. We kind of did something different because our match was pretty the same every night because we could do the same every night because, you know, we were in a different place and different crowd and yada yada. And if it broke, don't fix it. But we've been doing that on the holiday parks. And then we went out and get, got told we had to do like 18 minutes or something with each yeah. other. Totally different country. So we wanted to be Billy Big Bollocks. And we blew the referee up, didn't we? Yeah, do you remember when I got you to give me that um, putski hammer right in the face and I turned inside out and all that stuff? We never do it. Marty Gennetti. What's that, sorry? You were like Marty Gennetti with that flip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I was, do you remember me bigging it up all afternoon? I'm like, John, just take my face off. This is going to be great. I mean, what kind of young kid fantasises about taking a putski hammer? That's the weirdest thing ever. But you know what? It got over, didn't it? They thought you killed me. So that, that was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. I just remember the referee telling us to take it home, and we thought, "Fucking hell, that was, that was a quick eighteen minutes." And then yeah. we got back into the dressing room, and he says, "We were like, well, that went quick." And the referee said, "He's blown up." Yeah. yeah. The promoter gave us cheap. He was like, "Oh, you only did twelve minutes," but we yeah. we went on. We were told to go home. Yeah. yeah. It's just because the referee couldn't breathe. I, I never thought I'd see the time where I blew someone up. <laughs> you know, yeah. like. I'm blown up walking to the ring, but the fucking referee's blown up this time. <laughs> yeah, I remember it well. <laughs> We're about 35 minutes in, and I don't want to go too far because I don't want to go too deep into a conversation that we can't. Okay, you know, well, you know what? Sure. We'll have to do a part two because we've only covered 
four years, there's 20 other years, you know, 20 years, you know what I mean? We'll have to do a part two. Yeah, but it's, got, it's gone real quick. And, you know, there's there's a shed load that we can talk about, about not not just from there on, but involved in those four years as well. Yeah, yeah, um, cool. yeah. yeah. But I reckon if we knock it on the head here, because I don't, like I said, I don't want to get too far into a conversation that we that we can't get out of. But how can we get hold of Mad Dog if you know all these promoters all across the world? Because let's be fair, you go everywhere. There's not a country that I, there's, that you go places that I can't even spell the country name, let alone fucking places that you go. Right? You've yeah. been to Portugal, Japan, uh, uh, Austria, um, Warsaw. You've been everywhere. Um, anyone out there that wants to get hold of you, what do they do? Uh, don't. I don't like talking to people. No. <laughs> um, I've uh, I've deleted my Facebook app. I've still got the account, but I've deleted the app because um, Facebook was just doing me head in. You know, because of all this current political unrest and all this nonsense. So like, I'm not on that at the moment. I will go back. Um, I suppose Twitter. Just search for me on Twitter. I'm on there. But like. I don't know, I'm very much, you know, I'm insular, I stay in my own bubble, do you know what I mean? If people want to talk to me, they can get me on Twitter, but I don't, yeah, just leave me alone, I'm all right. I'll leave you alone if you leave me alone. <laughs> You're not that hard man to find, to be fair, are you? No. Sound, well, it's been cracking talking to you, and we will definitely do this again. I've got people booked in for a podcast, like, right in until the end of July. Next week, sorry, end of this week, Friday's episode, Barnsley Brawler will join me. Uh, first part of next week, Brian Logan from uh, Virginia, West Virginia. He's on. Uh, so, like, big, some big names coming over the next couple of weeks. But as soon as uh, I'm through those, we'll have a part two with Mad Dog Max and we'll go from America onwards. Yeah, okay, yeah. And but there might have to be a part three and a part four for that, you know. <laughs> no doubt, because I mean, there, there's things that I want to know, you know, that that you know, things that I wasn't around for that I really want to know about. We had like a parting of the ways, and then kind of came back, didn't we? You know, so yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't a parting of the ways, like there was no split. There was no like, oh, no, you know, no, it wasn't a part. You want you one of those that I've never fell out with, which is rare. So oh. you know, yeah, Let's yeah, appreciate that's that. I know it's weird, isn't it? No, it was a, it was a very natural. You know, you did your thing, I did our thing. But there's there's like a number of years where like I could ask you a ton of questions and vice versa. So that would be an interesting period to cover. Also, you can't sew me up with daft questions about my mask and stuff like that because you don't know the answers <laughs> to questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you could fill me full of bullshit though for those bits because I wouldn't know any yeah, different. That's when I'll just. <laughs> Noise, that'll be the best part of the you know that that middle part that'll be the best part i'll be like yeah john i, I, I flew to the moon and i wrestled the rock um and all the aliens <laughs> um, and i made four million dollars and um president barack obama shook my hand and gave me a medal and yeah yeah i can't wait to sell that bit <laughs> i look forward to it um we'll see the people at home i'll see the people at home on friday with um Barnsley Brawler. Until then, thank you, Mad Dog Max, and I shall speak to you very soon for part two, three, and four. Um.